Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Thaisi De Silva, and I am the director of the PBS NewsHour Student Reporting Labs program. Student Reporting Labs, or SRL, is a national public media initiative that connects middle and high school students with public media mentors from around the country to produce original reporting for the National Student Reporting Labs website, NewsHour.org, and the evening broadcast. Now, if you're sitting in this audience and you're unfamiliar with the NewsHour, it's PBS's nightly news program. It's been around since 1975, and it's known around the country for its in-depth reporting and analysis. Being a part of the NewsHour family gives our students a very unique platform. On any given night, our young reporters have the opportunity to be heard and to have their content seen by over 1 million plus, plus viewers pl um, per night, which is, we hope is really exciting for our students. When SRL launched in 2010, we started with six labs. When I joined the program, um, we had about 20. Fast forward four and a half years, and we're now in over 100 schools and after-school programs around the country. Our students report on important national topics such as race, immigration, and the dropout crisis um, across the US. Most recently, they've produced two national series. The first is called um, The New Safe, and it looked at what school safety, what school safety means in a post-Newtown uh, um, era. The second one was called Tough Calls, and students explored what um, the effects of concussions were on local youth football programs. So for all you math enthusiasts out in this crowd, um, here is a quick look at by the numbers. Since SRL launched, We've had 28 youth-produced stories on the NewsHour. We've had 15 collections of unique um, stories. So that equates to over 28 million viewers um, all looking at our student-produced content, which again is hopefully really exciting. So a lot of you who are in the crowd, you know, are your educators and you're thinking, wow, the NewsHour gets all this great content, but what do the students and the teachers get? So, we host a teacher professional development opportunity every summer. We fly out teachers, all expenses paid, um, for a four-day intensive boot camp. The teachers produce um, two stories. They learn the ins and outs of video journalism. And it's a real opportunity for our teachers to get together and talk about what's working in SRL and what we need to improve. Um, at the beginning of the school year, our team hosts Google Hangouts with every one of our 100 plus teachers. It's a moment for us to reflect on what we learned over the summer. It's a time to talk about goals for the school year, and it's a great opportunity for talk, to talk about possible outcomes and, and, and struggles that they might be facing and how to overcome them. We have a series of digital badges for our students um, that are tied to career ready skills, and so they can earn a videographer badge or an editing badge. And the cool thing is that we've connected it to um, so when a, lo when a student earns a badge, the local public media mentor, the station, the GM receives an alert and it just tells them like, you should be really paying attention to the student and their skill set. Um, we also host a Student Reporting Labs Academy. Um, it was the first time last year we brought out 17 students from around the country um, to join us. And again, it was an intensive boot camp. The idea was that the kids would learn these skills and take it back and apply it into their classroom and be real ambassadors to our program. So we talk a lot about shifts in attitude. Uh, Renee Hobbs and her team at the University of Ro Rhode Island did a three-year study on student reporting labs. And uh, these are just some of the things that um, they noticed. Uh, there was significant increase in intellectual curiosity and problem solving. There was heightened civic awareness and an increased likelihood that students would participate in civic engagement activities. And something we're really proud of is that Tuning in, they were, the kids were tuning in more to PBS and NPR and shying away from TMZ, which was, again, awesome for us. <laughs> <laughs> what our team noticed is that the kids are always really excited um, to report on social justice, right? So they're excited about race and telling stories about immigration. 
But along the way, we started to notice that there were a lot of kids excited about science reporting as well. And we're actually going to take a look at some of these examples. Okay. It's lunchtime at Phillips Academy Charter School in Newark, New Jersey. But lunchtime here looks a little bit different from other public schools. That's because students here serve each other healthy meals, family style. But the school's family style approach has run afoul of the United States Department of Agriculture, which oversees the National School Lunch Program. Although Phillips Academy serves many students who qualify for free and reduced lunches, it cannot receive federal funding for its Healthy Meals Program. To qualify for the federal lunch program, the USDA requires that adults serve a variety of foods in specified quantities and document what's being dished out to serve each student. At Phillips Academy, however, students serve themselves. It helps us learn how to create a balanced meal for, meal for ourselves. For example, the right amount of protein and the right amount of uh, grains and oils. Although federal officials still haven't given Phillips Academy the green thumbs up, friends and donors have been generous this year, helping to keep the school's approach to eating and learning alive for now. Texas is more than barbecue and Tex-Mex. Just ask this urban farmer in Austin. Aquaponics, as an idea, goes back to the Aztecs. And before that, the ancient Egyptians were doing different forms of this. The fish give off ammonia from their gills and from their, their waste. We pump that um, through a filter so we get rid of those solid wastes. And what flows through into the plant growing beds is ammonia-rich water. And that's the plant growing food. So the plants absorb the nitrate. And at this point, the ammonia has been removed and the water pumps back to the fish tanks in a big circulating loop. Wade desired to bring a new method of farming to Central Texas when he founded Algo Dulce Farm in the summer of 2011. He hoped food grown here would appeal to local chefs. Three years later, his vegetables are featured on the menu of several high-end Austin restaurants. So why do small farms often have to charge more for their product than commercial farms? There's a few reasons. One is because places like HEB and Walmart are I don't want to say fixing prices, but they're buying huge, huge amounts, and so they can negotiate on price much, much better than a little guy could. Uh, two is a small farmer who's, who's new or starting out or has less land is more susceptible to nature. So they might have an insect infestation on, that kills two-thirds of their crop, and they still need to pay their bills, so they charge a little higher price to make up for, for the crop that's gone. And then finally, there's the perception of organics that they should be more expensive, and so we're just going to charge more for it. Now, a story that comes to us via our network of student reporting labs around the country. Montana is a special place with these rivers. Trout fishing is part of our heritage, and especially, you know, native trout. I think catching those fish is just really special. It really connects you to the river and to the to you know a part of Montana's past. People are illegally dumping new fish species like northern pike, walleye, and lake trout into Montana's waters. And what's happening now with the illegal introductions is we have people who aren't professional biologists. We have people who are going out there at night thinking they know better. Bruce Farling is the executive director of Montana Trout Unlimited, a nonprofit conservation organization. He says professional biologists introduce fish that will hopefully restore and maintain ecosystems while bucket biologists are dumping in species they would like to fish for. It's not good for maintaining sort of species diversity. It can have impacts on the whole aquatic ecosystem. It makes me sad. You know, obviously I would like to, you know, share experiences, you know, with my, with my kids. And, you know, having those shared experiences talking about trout, um, it's important. You know, I want them to be able to go to some of the places that I've fished. So it's really important to note that those are all student-produced pieces. The students come up with the pitches, they shoot all original footage, they conduct the interviews, they create the pre-interview questions, the interview questions, they submit a rough script, a rough cut, and we're there to guide them the entire way. We provide feedback and then it's up to the students to make sure that they take our feedback and, and apply it. Also some other things. Um, the young lady at the end was 18 years old when she produced that piece and again was seen by a national audience. 
uh, the two young ladies you saw at the end went on to receive internship or to conduct internships at their local PBS station, which is something that we're hoping to grow. Um, the, in the pilot year, we were able to connect two students with their local public media stations for paid summer internships. In year two, that number grew to three, and we're hoping that this summer to make it five. So that's really exciting. Also, two of those stories were produced um, by Title I schools, which is something I didn't mention earlier. SRL is committed to working um, with Title I students in underserved communities, which is something we're really proud of. So when we started to see kind of a flood of science reports, we wanted to make sure that we were giving our teachers and our students the tools they needed to tell good science stories, which is why I'm here. Um, so we applied for a grant through the National Science Foundation to basically engage the next generation of science reporters. And we were the recipients of this award. And so what we're doing next. NSF has given us the funding to launch 17 experimental SRL STEM labs where the focus is science reporting. As you can see, they're all over the country, and again, with a focus on Title I. Because this is something really new, um, we've, we're creating a, a different sort of approach to engage these students. We've hired Clara Valdivia, who is with us in the audience, as our STEM curriculum manager. And basi basically, she'll be taking the existing SRL curriculum and restructuring it um, to engage science, or science uh, communicators. And what we hope to uh, create are lesson plans that provide core resources for teachers who wish to teach science journalism. Um, we want to make these kids know that STEM is everywhere and that they have personal connections to STEM. We're also going to give them very um, specific story prompts. So every year, we'll develop um, assignments and a signature series um, to facilitate um, the story selection and the story process. So this spring, when we launch, we'll be focusing on climate change. And the prompt goes, um, an overwhelming majority of science agree that global climate change is happening and that humans are the primary cause. For this PBS NewsHour SRL signature series, we challenge you to add the global discussion on climate change by showing its local impacts in your community. And so Claire and our team have devised three different routes that the students can take to find the story. And one is find the work of a researcher at a local university or research center and show how their work can improve the future. Um, highlight a person or group in your community that is affected by climate change, impacts on health, energy, ecosystems, or food supply and agriculture. Or three, highlight a person or group working to slow climate change or minimize its impacts. So again, we're launching this this spring. And um, hopefully, we'll be invited back to talk a little bit about what we've learned. Um, and before I leave, um, you know, again, guys, the goal is to engage this next generation of science storytellers and science communicators, uh, like these young women we've been working with. So you could play that. Sophie, one of the things that we think about is how people react to your work, right? So how did your friends, your community respond to your story? Well, I think that mostly it was because nobody really gave the um, food program at my school a second thought. So when we came out with the news story and people were actually saying it would have been changed by the USDA because it wasn't something that they liked, people started to think, wow, this is something that we really like and it could be changed. What can we do to prevent that? Mary, I want to ask you, Doing reports, did they increase your awareness of all the other reporting that's out there, especially about science? All of a sudden, I cared way more, just because I had a much better sense of awareness of how that could affect my community. And I think that was hugely important to my education and basically how I carried out everything else that I was going to do from there on out. When I see something on television or online, I kind of ask myself, is this true, where they're getting their sources from? I go search up on the topic, do some new things myself, and see how can I help them if what they're doing is positive. Interestingly, all of you had sort of food-related stories, um, but let's say there's, there's the bigger topics that we're grappling with right now, right? So climate change, water scarcity, 
immigration. I mean, these are big ideas, big challenges that are facing the country. Um, how can journalism by youth reporters help inform people about these really big meaty issues? It's easier to talk to the millennials if you're actually a millennial yourself because not only can you, you have that connection with them. You, you can see what they're going through, you can understand what they're going through. And so I think that helps. It definitely offers a, a fresher perspective and uh, we may be able to draw something out of the person we're interviewing um, a little bit easier than someone that is older. One of the biggest differences between a younger reporter and an older one is just the way they look at things. Um, our generation has a fundamentally different way of looking at issues than the generation ahead of us or even the generation before us. It's just a fresh take on some big issue that everyone is talking about. And I think it's important because one day we're going to be the ones having to make those decisions and having to determine what our future is going to be so if you're interested in becoming a lab, please visit studentreportinglabs.com and check out at Reporting Labs for any updates. Thank you so much.